questions and thanks everyone for coming. And we'll go ahead and start. Welcome to Bird Chat. You can write any questions uh, and please write uh, where you're from if you haven't been coming, you're new to this, if you'll write it in the chat, okay? All right, so we'll have some announcements and plant of the week and um, then mystery bird and this week in Central Florida birding and then our program, summer birding and the June challenge with the bird chat team. Um, so the upcoming bird chats, June 3rd, we're going to have Hannah and Eric go birding. This is something that Kathy's found of a podcast and it should be really fun. June 10th, we have of the Florida big year presentation by Natasha Fontaine and Robert Gundy, who have been leaders at the North Shore Birding Festival this past okay. year. So we got to know them and they just finished their Florida big year and <laughs> tell us all about it. <laughs> See if you mute can the dog. mute yourself, please. Okay, June 17th um, is our uh, wrap up for our regular Orange Audubon programs, the Chertok Awards program. Um, our treasurer and Chertok chair, um, Teresa, will present. And it's always very fun. And we also have a silent auction associated with it, which will be online. And then June 24th, uh, another one from Alachua. Uh, we're, we're having Bringing Birds to Your Yard by Ron Robinson. All right. And um, so now I'll do very quickly a plant of the week. Um, I want to talk about the string lily or swamp lily, Crinum americanum, which has been um, cultivated and sold in cultivation and its range is throughout the South. And here's a picture comparing the string lily to the spider lily. And uh, this has been confusing to me for a while till I got this pictures to compare. So this, this membranous area is how you distinguish the string lily from the spider lily or, and this particular one is called the alligator lily. Okay. All right. So just a couple more announcements that we have a field trip this Saturday to Three Lakes Wildlife Management Area. It's one of the limited edition field trips that does charge. Most of our field trips are free, but it's $10 for members and it'll have a maximum of 15 people. And you do have to register in advance. In this COVID era, we are very careful um, and uh, you need to register in advance with Kathy and here's her email. And it's a great place. Um, you, it's got the red cockaded woodpeckers and it's got grasshopper, Florida grasshopper sparrows and a lot of unusual birds down there. I tell oh, Kite, if, we, if we're lucky. Um, Kathy and Susan, can you do the duties that Jack usually does? Thank you. Okay, and then um, Kathy is leading a June challenge kickoff field trip at Orlando Wetlands Park with leaders Gigi Del Piso and Lori Lilja. And that's Saturday, June 5th, 7 a.m. to about noon, uh, $10. It's a fundraiser for, for Orange Audubon. And to reserve, please email, same email, K at aol.com. Should be fun. And now we'll get into the June challenge. And I want to thank Alachua Audubon for starting that 2000, back in 2004. And we have on, um, we have the pleasure of having on tonight, longtime birding leader and count compiler for Alachua Audubon, Rex Rowan. So Rex, do you want to say a few words about how you got that started? Sure, thanks for having me on. Um, it started in late spring of 2004, when Becky Ennis and Bob Carroll and I were birding at San Falasco Hammock looking at Savannah Sparrows. And uh, Becky was complaining about the fact that, that after spring migration, there were no birding activities to, to keep her occupied. And so she decided she was going to come up with something, make a suggestion. And she came up with two. Uh, one was the June challenge, but there was another one, which was also briefly popular, at least in Alachua County, called the summer challenge, which was like a two hour big day. 
She said, you could choose a route, start anytime, but you had only two hours to compile the largest list you could. And that was, uh, you could do it in June or July. But that one didn't quite have the legs that, uh, that the June challenge had. Uh, we started as, as I say, in 2004. And uh, in 2010, we uh, decided to see if the rest of the state was interested in it. So we started, you know, we took it to the list serves and uh, a lot of people got interested in that and participated in a lot of different counties. We actually even had some people uh, from England who got involved in that one. And uh, so it went on that way, I guess until about 2016, 2017, when a fellow named Trey Mitchell started a, a website to start counting up the results automatically. And so I passed it on to, uh, to Trey at that point, who unfortunately died the following, following year. And uh, since then, I guess we've had a, a couple different uh, people take over the statewide uh, competition, but uh, I've continued to, to coordinate the one in Alachua County. And this will be our 18th year, I think. Uh, we still, still enjoy pretty good participation and uh, uh, we've got a lot of uh, new young birders this year who, who I think are really, really looking forward to uh, to competing and, uh, and uh, showing us old timers how it's done. <laughs> That's great. And so there's a competition now among counties and uh, what Pinellas is coming up and Miami-Dade? Yes, the, uh, I think that was something that, that a lot of the larger counties uh, decided to do was to, to compete among themselves to see which county could come up with with the largest list. Uh, and we don't actively, I mean, we never actively discouraged that, but that was, that was sort of not the point. The point was to make it an intra-county competition because uh, Alachua County, because it doesn't have a coast, can't compete with Miami-Dade or Pinellas. We can only compete with each other because we all have the same ground to cover. And it's the same, you know, Pinellas, all the Pinellas birders can compete with each other, but uh, they didn't see it that way. So, <laughs> so there has been some inter-county competition as well. All right, well, we'll come circle around and talk about it at the very end again, but let's get going with first the mystery bird. All right. So everybody, we have this lovely mystery bird. I love this picture. Obviously this is a wetlands bird. Um, and you can see he's just kind of peeking his head out. And that's probably about what you'll typically see. They're very acrobatic. They are a migrant, just came back in some numbers to this area. And Kim Root is guessing a tricolored heron, but let's try again. It's not a tricolored. What do you guys think? Okay, Marty's got it, green heron. So let's go to the next slide. We can go to the next. I'm trying. Just a second. Oh, I don't know why it's not. There you go. Sorry. Okay. And I've got to love this guy's hair. It's the green heron. And we're going to thank Joseph Miliaka for these pictures. And we can go to the next one. And this is kind of a, a little bit of look of where um, he is. We do have these guys. Oh, I said, I'm thinking of the, sorry, a bit turn when I said migrating. This guy's year round here in the swamps. And you can see he's very coastal in his distribution. Um, he does go up to the north to breathe, some of them, and but he will stay year round here. So then we have had a really good week in Florida birding. So you know how we kind of started doing some highlight birds. So one of the things that lot is the black terns have moved back in and we're starting to see them as they do their migration up north. Um, black skimmers are being seen. Um, which, you know, at the coast that's common, but at Lod it's kind of fun for us to see them here in the wetlands. Tell everybody what Lod is. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't been there, it's a great place and you see all kinds of things. And also on the coast, 
of course, I was out of town <laughs> when this occurred, but there was a great time for some pelagics. There were several days when people got a lot of lifers. Sherry Brown shared with us some pictures. And obviously these are scope and very distant birds, but recognizable. We got the leech, leech's storm petrel and the Wilson's storm petrel. And we can go next. And also had the Arctic Tern at Jetty Park. So really good pelagic birds this week. So very good. And also in South Florida, some of our birders went to the south. And Lori Lilja gave us some of these pictures. She was seeing the Common Hill Mina, obviously the burrowing owls, blue crown parakeets, and actually she had a lot of other parakeets that are down there. And we'll go to some other pictures. She also got the roseate tern, the Antillian night hawk down in the keys and the spot breasted oriole. And I think every single one of these birds would be lifers for me. So I'm gonna, I need to plan that trip to the keys and South Florida. Next. So now we're gonna start summer birds of central Florida. Okay, so I'm going to take over from here for a little bit. And our goal is to share with you if, if you decide to take the challenge, which I'll warn you, <laughs> it's addicting. I've been doing it for a few years now, and it is a lot of fun. So these are some birds that are relatively easy to find and some that are not relatively easy to find. We'll try to point out a few tips and everything here that you're going to see in our program tonight, except this week in birding, are birds you could potentially find here. Okay, next slide, please. So before we get started, summer is for nesting, and we need to make sure everyone understands that nesting birds are particularly vulnerable, and they do need an extra protection. So as you're out doing your summer birding, even if you're not doing cha June challenge, but you're in your yard, watching from your window, or going, you know, maybe the wildlife drive, um, you might see nests. There's a really good chance you're going to see some kind of bird nest with birds in it. Here's um, from the Audubon Guide to Ethical Bird Photography and Videography. Even if you're not taking photos or videos, always keep a respectful distance from the nest. Um, if the parent looks or starts changing behavior, you're too close, back away. Avoid flushing the adults, scaring the young, or doing anything to draw the attention of predators because you're not the only one. Look, you, you, we wanna see them because they're, they're beautiful, they're cute. We wanna know more, but the predators out there looking for them. So you don't wanna do anything to draw attention to that nest. Another thing to keep in mind, particularly if you have a nest where you live, repeatedly walking to the nest can leave a scent trail and a foot trail for predators. So if you're checking on a nest, maybe you're doing Project Nest Watch, which is a great project from Cornell Lab. Actually, you have to take a little, little mini class and they make sure that you do this. You don't always, you don't wanna go the same way each time to look at your nest. And don't cut anything from around the nest, such as branches, or leaves as these provide camouflage and cover. Okay, next. So something else that always comes up and we always get lots of questions, you might find a baby bird, whether around your home or when you're out about in a park. So if it's a fledgling and it has feathers, they might not be full feathers, but it has feathers, leave them be. Hopping and fluttering on their own, leave them alone. These babies have grown and they need to move around, flap their wings and learn to fly. At this stage, predators may be aware of the nest and hiding among the vegetation is safer for them. You know, if you're really, really concerned then go way, way far away and watch them from a distance. And of course, if there's like outdoor cats in your area, just keep an eye on that. Now nestlings are mostly featherless and sometimes even the eyes are not yet open. They might've fallen from their nest. Best thing to do is to try to get the baby back in the nest if you can. Um, licensed wildlife rehab rehabilitators. If the nest is destroyed, you can contact a rehabilitator through the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission or go to the Orange Audubon website. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Susan and we split this up into wetlands and that's just my parakeet. <laughs> wetlands and upland birds though, 
just a footnote, you know, sometimes they do go in between. So you could possibly um, find a wetlands bird in the uplands. I've seen, um, oh goodness, um, kingfishers passing through. Um, so it is possible. Oh, and thank you, Teresa, for reminding me. You should not be doing any kind of bird calling during breeding season. No pishing, no playing recordings, because what you're going to do is pull the parents off the nest. You don't want to do that. So please don't do that at this time. All right, over to Susan. All right, wetland birds. One of our, some of our more famous ones are the fulvous whistling ducks and the whistling ducks that we have here. A lot of people, when they come into town, that's what they want to see. We do have a lot of these great ducks at Lake Popka Wildlife Drive. You can find them there. And any of our wetlands should have these ducks. There's an American coot in the background and so there's a few of those around too. You have to look a little hard. Now she was saying that some of them are a little harder. The coot would, might be a little bit harder to find, but we do have some here. Um, next. So this is kind of a great photo of the babies. <laughs> I mean, a wonderful photo of the fullest duck with its little ducklings. So that's one of the great things about summer. Maybe the weather's a little bit warmer, but you're seeing some things you really can't see the rest of the year. Next, we also have the black belly whistling duck. I mean, this one, when I first moved here to Florida, it amazed me that there's a duck in a tree sitting there and, you know, they sit there a lot. But these are great, very attractive ducks. They're great for pictures. Next. And, they're all, and when they fly overhead, you can kind of hear them calling, whistling, and see the great pattern on their wings. So it's kind of a really nice, easily identifiable birds when they're flying. And next. Other things that you'll find in the wetland, the red-winged blackbirds. They're real common birds, but right now they're doing a lot of um, calling for mating. They're really popping out those red on their wings. They're going to be turning their wings, uh, kind of turning them in so that red pops out. Common gallon mules with chicks and babies. They'll be swimming. As you can see, this is a great picture that Joyce got with the baby chick and a flower. So that's kind of really pretty. And those will be all over. Also the little blue herons, you're gonna see all the different, you'll probably see different phases. The white is the immature, um, very immature. And as it starts to slowly turn into the adult, it's gonna go through a little bit more phases, splotchy color as it gets that full blue color. So it's gonna be kind of moving towards that full blue adult plumage. It's gonna take it a while and it's going to, we're gonna have some great looking birds. Next. Okay, and hingas. I put this picture in because I think one of the things about summer and hingas, we see them a lot, but one of the most amazing thing is the chicks, how cute and cuddly they look compared to how pointy and not so cute the adult looks. Um, it's also very interesting to see them feeding um, with those beaks. That's gotta be a real challenge. Next. And one of the other things I do want to mention is cormorants are also in this area, but they're very, very hard to find. So white ibises and glossy ibises, those are birds that'll be easy for easier to see. Um, Actually, glossy. Susan, um, yes. we the the ibises nest kind of very secretive in in wetlands, and mm -hmm. we don't often get to see. But this these are the very first stage of the white ibis. Oh, Joyce. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I wasn't looking that close at it. Yeah, we don't see it very often. Joyce caught this photo. I've only seen it like once. Very nice. So they are darker. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the least bit, this is the one that I actually referred to, and I'm not sure, but when I, they are coming back in, they're doing their acrobatics. You can see them very um, easy to see right now because they're real active. At Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive, I think they're uh, people have been having a lot of reports of seeing them. So this is a great bird of summer. And next, and you can, this is a real young one that Jack got a picture of um, peeping through the grasses. So that's really a great photo. And this is the range. So they kind of go way down to South America. They're year round there. They move from where we are down to like Central America there. 
they come back up. We have some, there's a few that stay. We're kind of right on that border for breeding in year round. So we have some that stay, but we get a lot, a, a lot more of them at this time of year because we do have the migrants coming in. Next, purple gallinules. These are always great birds to see, beautiful coloring. They're gonna be making nests, having babies. I think they probably already made their nests because I'm hearing a lot of reports of babies all over the place. Um, but they're a good, here's some of the pictures somebody just took of them with their babies out and walking in, in the wetlands. And as you can see, the juveniles, eh, they get kind of gawky before they get cute. They're a little cuter when they're small and then they kind of go through teenage phase. Next. Distinguishing common and purple gallinule juveniles. So on the left, you'll see the um, common gallinules, and on the right, the purple. One of the easiest ways is to look around for an adult. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing I use is the common gallinule always has white on the edge of the wings. Um, Anybody else want to weigh in? Uh, Sam? Yeah, and um, uh, um, also the purple gallinu has a kind of a brown greenish tinge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, next, snail kites. These are great. That you can see those in the wetlands in our area, um, hovering over. You can see we got. Uh, they're kind of like, sometimes you can go and wait and you'll see one if you have a good spot. I think Newton Park's a good one if you go there and you just kind of hang out, it'll, one will eventually fly by. So and, that's kind of a nice thing. And before you leave this one, this is a bird that has been expanding its range because before finding one the challenge was really hard because you had to go to Joe Over Street, but because they like the invasive apple snails, that have been spreading throughout the waterways, they are spreading and actually where Rex is from in Alachua, they actually have more than we do. So it's a happy story. That is true. And next, swallowtail kite. We're always excited when they come back because they're so beautiful. Um, as you can see, Sam got a great picture of one in flight, we can see it. And Joseph got a great one sitting, which is really hard. I don't think I, I saw one once, I think sitting, but you know, they're always in the air. They eat while they're flying. Um, so these are a great bird to see. And if you wanna see, go ahead and go to the next one. If you will go to the end of the drive, see this big kettle at the bottom, that's from the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive. At the end of the season, like what is it, late July? Yeah, yeah. mid July, late July. She's frozen. Okay, she she told me that she might lose. I, I'll pick up here. Um, so towards the end of their season, when they're feeding really heavily for their long, long migration um, to South America you're going to see these huge kettles starting out about 11 o'clock. It's totally amazing. And then the picture on the top is from an undisclosed location. There's places where the birds stage before they take off on their migration. And you got to realize these birds breed here and the, 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 this year's birds make that trip on their own. So it's really amazing. Okay. You can go to the next slide, please. So another one of our really fun summer breeder birds is the black neck stilt. And one way you can definitely tell this bird when it flies over, it has these bubblegum pink long legs and they make a lot of noise when they have the chicks. They're very loud, very effective parents on trying to ward off any, any threat. Next slide. So um, actually right now, if you're on the wildlife drive and the good news is, is most of these are far off the road, you can see them sitting, they nest right on the ground. And that's pretty amazing given the size of the alligators out there. <laughs> um, and then on the right, you can see a very newly hatched chick. Um, they really, if you look at the picture, they really blend in with the vegetation as, as they're feeding. Next slide. 
And here's a great photo with some adults and you notice the juveniles are more brownish on their heads and backs and that one in the middle is smaller. So it won't be long, we'll be seeing them in this stage, okay. they grow really quick. <clears throat> Most of them leave us in the fall. Um, a few overwinter here, but um, mostly they just breed here. Next. And the black neck stilk is pretty easy to find for some uh, June challenge. Now here's a barn swallow. This is a great photo from Jack. Um, if you get out early enough where, you, where they are before they start really flying around, you can find them perched on sticks or sometimes wires. It's a great place to look at them and study them and look at their coloration. And sometimes you'll see different swallows. So we'll point that out in a moment. Next. So these um, do breed here. So you can see here, one, the one on the left is on a wire and the barn swallow does have a really long tail that is forked. And there's a lot on the wildlife drive. There's a lot at the wetlands park and a lot of lakes. If you go around lakes and ponds around here, you're gonna see them um, feeding on insects over the lakes. Next. So um, they make mud nests. Um, um, here right now they do it under bridges so on the wildlife drive there's low bridges and you can't go under there and you shouldn't go under there but you can hear them and you see them flying out and when when the babies you know hatch you'll see them carrying food in for them um, there's a few places that you can go and you can actually see the nest but it's like I said keep a keep a good distance don't disturb them you got some potter wasps there too with them oh yeah and um, you can sometimes when they're building their nests, like I've seen this out near St. John's River, you can see them going to the mud flats and getting the mud. That's fun to watch. Next. So here's some of the other less common swallows. Um, the rough wing is really hard in June. I got lucky and we happened to come across, I think about seven, that was about a month ago. I haven't seen one since. So that's a really hard one. If, you know, there may be one that, you know, didn't go through the migration or is young. So you could get lucky and see one of those. The cliff swallows, there's a few places around that they do hang out. Um, sometimes we get them on the wildlife drive. Not too often. Is Susan back? If you're back, Susan, you can jump in. Um, and I'm back, but I'm not sure. <laughs> You can jump in. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and then on the bottom is the bank swallow. They, we do have a few of those at the Wildlife Drive also. I think, Kathy, you just saw this one the other day, correct? Yes. So you, you have to look. It's hard to see those swallows flying by, but if you can catch them perched, that's the best time to right. see them. Because it's much smaller than the barn. And it is much smaller, yes. <laughs> and next. Okay, next. Okay, the other birds that kind of favor the wetlands, obviously the common yellow throat. Those are gonna be very hard to see in June, but they're there, you'll hear them. Um, oops. I'm sorry. Uh-oh, we're <laughs> going fast. <laughs> Let's see back to this one, okay. Yeah, and then of course the Northern Perula. Those you'll see Actually, if you go to the wetlands, you'll hear them and see them. They're going to be, again, nesting and kind of busy. So you should be able to see those. Uh, next. One of the specialty ones you're going to have to look hard for if you really want to see something special is the prothonotary warbler. Deborah Green took this one picture at Silver River. Um, they are cavity nesters. They do use old holes and like to have those as their nest. They do like the wetlands. Um, you'll see them. It is, again, very fun to watch them going in and out of those cavities. I think they're, I just got back from McGee Marsh and there was one that hole with prothonotory nesting about two feet from the boardwalk. So it was kind of a very busy place. A lot of photographers getting a picture of that famous prothonotary going in and out. Mm -hmm. Next. And now we're going to turn it back over to Kathy for upland birds. And a little tip about the prothonotary, you want to go like where there's a river 
like that, um, like the Wakaiba River. And you'd probably need to kayak or canoe to, to ba maybe find them. So that's a really tough one. That's one I did not find last year. <laughs> Some and I missed I, this year. <laughs> and I've noticed an association with pop ashes um, that have a hole that rot out and have holes that they, they like. So if you know that tree, pop ash, it, it helps. Pays to learn the trees. So we're gonna switch gears. And these birds again are mostly found in the uplands, though there's some of these, and I'll point out that will be like on the edge near a wetlands. Um, so I'll point those out, starting with this one. So this is a young male orchard oriole and they arrived to our area back from migration about March, probably mid-March. So this is a young male singing. And so he's on the wildlife drive, but he, he doesn't necessarily need to be like right where the water is. And there's some um, drier areas of the wildlife drive and I've seen them in my neighborhood. But finding them in June is a little hard because mostly they're not singing. When they're singing, they're pretty easy to find. So remember again, can't play tape to try to lure them in. You gotta depend on your skill. Okay, next slide. So here's the female. Um, and so they are nesting now. And you know, if you're patient and you knew where they were singing before they stopped singing, you might get lucky and see the adults feeding the young and be able to see them that way. So that's a nice female orchard oriole. Next. So this was a, a really hard find. And, and if you ever do come across this, just really, really, really keep your distance and don't tell anyone until after they fledge. So this is a ruby-throated hummingbird on a nest um, found here in central Florida with the chicks in the nest. And it was just, and if, if you didn't know where it was, you would never see it. And if you took your eyes off it, you wouldn't find it again. It was just <laughs> so tiny, so amazing to watch these birds. And, you know, they do use um, lichens and spider webs. And the female is the one that builds off the nest and takes care of the young. So she's a hard working girl. That's a great photo from Sam. Next. So this is one that I was able to see and I'm not the photographer Sam is, but it was really cool because I was out with a friend doing June challenge and we were just looking at what we could find. And these blue gray gnat catchers, which we have two populations. We have migratory ones that come through and we have tons of them in the spring. And then we have some that stay back and they breed here. And if you know their call, when, when they're feeding their babies, which was what we saw, you'll see um, the, the parents going in and out of the nest. So we stayed at a respectful distance and got to see the nest wasn't much bigger than a hummingbird nest. And instead of lichens, it had little vines all around it. And then Susan showed me her picture from Ohio and the one up in Ohio had vines around it, which I found very interesting. Next. So here's a bird that um, does breed here, but it's, it's, very, it's hard to find. Now, I did see two like earlier this week and I don't know that I found one last year. They're, they're somewhat secretive. Um, you just gotta be lucky. And maybe if you've seen one before June, you might look in the same place, but they're really handsome birds. And as you can see, they um, winter in South America. They're a type of flycatcher. Okay, next. All right, and these are some awesome pictures from Sam. So this is the loggerhead shrike and it's a really cool bird. It's small, but it's mighty. It, it, it's called the butcher bird because it will um, like impale its prey on a thorn or it likes barbed wire. And that looks like a little ring neck, <clears throat> I believe. Sam, you can correct Yeah, me. it's a ring neck thing. That's from Joe Overstreet, actually. Yeah, so they're really cool. They're not as common as they used to be. I, I hear birders talking about that they were more common. So evidently something we're doing is not agreeing with them, but you can still find them. They're a little bit harder to find. So that's a, a little bit of a challenge bird, but they're definitely worth looking for. And next. So this one's not too hard. So if you go to any pine forest, 
Um, even where there's just a few pine trees, like in your neighborhood, you still could get these. These are pine warblers. These are kind of fun because particularly in the summer when their breeding plumage is gone, they can look like lots of other things. They can be really dull looking um, and they can uh, look very gray. And in the spring, some are really bright yellow um, and they're very active. And I notice when I see them in the, in the uplands in the summer, they're really actively feeding their young. And when the young become more independent, they'll be flitting all around and be like, what is that? And it's probably pine warblers. So that one shouldn't, shouldn't be that uh, difficult. Let's see. And I think, um, oh, Shauna said there's some logger headed shrikes near lot entrance. Cool. That's one neat thing about June challenge um, is that people do like to share information as long as we know everyone's going to be ethical about um, respecting the birds space. Okay, next. So here's a bird that's singing a lot right now. Now I don't know if he'll be singing next Tuesday when June comes around. <laughs> that's the whole thing about this June challenge. Like on May 31st, I remember last year, we saw lots of shorebirds. You remember that, Sam? Yeah. Then June 1st rolled around. They were gone. They were gone. I mean, <laughs> I'm telling the truth. We had like white rump sandpipers and yep. all kinds of stuff and they they were gone. So it's it, it does make you nuts. Um, these guys will sing. They're singing a lot right now. They are tricky, though, because they like to be high up in the tree and they don't move around a lot. So they'll be up there singing, singing. You'll be like last year. I couldn't. So here's one of the rules of June challenge. You need to see the bird. OK, because normally most birders, when we bird, we count a bird if, if we've OK, everyone has their own set of criteria. Most birders I know they'll count a bird if they've seen it before and if they, it's not a live bird and they hear it and you know for sure it's the call, call of that bird. So, you know, today I was out in the uplands and yeah, they were singing and oh, it was way back in the woods. I'm like, well, if it's June, I'd be trying to look for it. <laughs> last year I had one and we knew what tree it was in. We knew and that thing didn't move and we never saw it, but they're really pretty bird. And next, so um, this is also, this is a bird that could be found in uplands and wetlands because I've seen it in both places. Fairly common bird all over the white-eyed vireo. Most of you are familiar with its call, um, but seeing it in June is really hard. Now, last month, super easy. They were singing all over the place. Now this particular bird, um, someone else told me about the nest and I, luckily there was a picnic table nearby and I just, it was far enough away and I just sat there quietly. I had to wait like a half an hour and the parent came in and fed the young and it was really amazing. There was lots of mosquitoes though. So you have to pay your dues when you're, <laughs> when you're waiting for birds in the summer here in the South. Next. So here is a, a fairly, very easy bird. And if you're around this area, you probably have them in your neighborhood because they like open areas. They're feeding on insects. This is the chimney swift. They, we call them the flying cigars because they have that cigar shaped body. And they'll be here until the early fall. Um, they'll migrate to South America. Um, and then they return back in the spring. And so like in June, July, you have a chimney and you, you may very well have these if you haven't blocked it and you'll get the babies and they'll be making lots and lots of noise. All right, next. Here's another fairly easy bird to um, spot. And actually, personally, I think they're expanding their range. I, I've been seeing them in my neighborhood and I never used to see them before. And other people I talked to have them in their neighborhood. So they can do okay in residential areas. They like farmland because they like to hunt in open places. You'll see them like up in a tree branch and then they'll dive down and they'll grab like an insect and they'll fly back up. And this would be a busy time because they're gonna be nesting. And you may see bluebird houses, like you may have them in your neighborhood or at a park. So if you just stay at a respectful distance, they're, they're pretty easy to find, but they do like the um, uplands. 
Next. Next. Okay. So here's one that's usually really easy to find, but something about June. Last year, it took me a couple weeks to find one, even though they call a lot. This is the Eastern Toey. And if you're in a scrubby area in the uplands, um, they'll call a lot. Now I have seen them on the edge of the wetlands, like on the wildlife drive, they're, they're kind of there in the beginning, but something about June, they'll be calling, calling, but it may be because they have young, that might be why they stay in the really scrubby places, thick and close to the ground. So they're really hard to see. So that is Eastern Toey. Next. So here's another one of our specialties. This is the Bachman Sparrow and, and you would need to be um, in a well-managed sandhill habitat. They're not gonna be just in any pine woods. They need to be in the sandhill. So be sure you watch our program on Wakaiba Springs State Park because we talk about the management of the sandhill and the burning that needs to occur to mimic the natural cycle of fire. And this is one of the birds that really needs that. So it's, it's, a, um, it's here year round, it's our only native, besides the Florida grasshopper sparrow, which is super, super rare. This is our only native sparrow that uh, breeds here. And they talk, um, I mean, they sing a lot and they have that here, kitty, kitty, kitty song, but one could be singing, 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 and you know the direction's coming from, and because they're so, you know, drab color, they're really hard to see. <laughs> next, so this next picture was from last year's June challenge, and we got lucky to uh, see a young one, because the young ones, you know, their behavior's a little different. It was curious. It was like on a low oak branch. It wasn't calling. You know, we were walking by and was like, what is that? Because it looks a little bit different than the adult. Um, then we, you know, we're able to get a picture and looked at it and said, oh, that's the Bachman. So we got lucky. Sometimes the June challenge, there's some luck involved and persistence. So getting out there a lot. If you don't get there, out there a lot, you won't get the opportunities to just happen upon something. Okay, next. <clears throat> Here's another summer breeder in our area. Um, this is the summer tanager. This is the male. The female is more of a yellowish mustard yellow color. And they're another one. They'll sing, sing, or the females also will call. They have like a little rattle call. And you'll know that they're up in a tree and they're a bright color. Sometimes they're really hard to spot. You have to come out with your patience. Next. All right, and then there's several woodpeckers. And here's another little tip. So during the year, like when we start our birding year in January, we kind of note where to find these things, particularly the hairy woodpecker, because that's kind of a hard one to find. Um, up north, they're common. Down here, we have very few pairs. The ones that are here do nest here, but you kind of have to know. So Tosahatchee is one place um, and Clearwater Lake, which is in Lake County, not Orange. Um, is another place to find them. Of course, we have the pileated, which is not too hard to find because they're pretty big and you, you may likely have them in your neighborhood. And then the red-headed woodpecker is down here, mostly a sandhill specialty. So if you go to a well-managed sandhill, whether it's um, Hal Scott, Tosahatchee, or Wakaiba Springs, you have a good chance to see these. And in the summer, you're gonna see the adults flying and bringing food to the nest and you can't miss them because they have that wide uh, patch of white on their wings so they really stand out. Okay, next. All right, this bird is pretty easy to find because they're really loud and they're in your neighborhood and they're in the uplands too. And this is the great crested flycatcher. It's our flycatcher of the summer. Um, they're very loud, like I said, you, they'll fly catch on a branch um, they do nest in tree cavities, or you can put out a nesting box, or you can check at local parks. They may have these nesting boxes, and you can pretty easily find one of these guys in the summer. Next. And then this one's a little harder. Right now, this guy, the blue grosbeak, there's one on the wildlife drive, and it's pretty vocal right now. And 
the, you can pretty much pick this one out. But last year, I remember Susan, I, and Sam just waiting at the wildlife drive at the gate, just looking, looking. <laughs> he was really hard to find. So that's another tough one. Next. And then this one looks a little bit similar, a little bit smaller, not as heavy beak, doesn't have the rust on the side. And this is the indigo bunting. Of course, if it's a female, it's gonna be fairly brown with just a little bit of blue. And yeah, I've been looking for these lately and haven't found any yet, so. And uh, full disclosure, this one Susan took when she just came back from uh, McGee Marsh. So <laughs> you might notice the pussy willow, which we don't really have many of. All right, next. And then we have our birds of prey. The red tail hawk is not too hard to find. And they do prefer the uplands because they like to hunt mammals. Next. And we this one is fairly easy. The Mississippi kite, they have come in. We get a few breeding populations. You can see they're a long distant migrant. So that one's not too hard to find. And usually they hang out with the swallowtail kites sometimes. Next. And then I know someone mentioned at the beginning the crest of Caracara. So you do want to look and it there. See, Orange County is a little tough because we're like on the very nor uh, northern part of their range. So like Taylor Creek Road is probably the best place um, to look, but they're really handsome. Next. And then the short tailed hawks, which is we're about the uh, the northernmost part of their range and we had one on our survey last week and actually the photo on the right from Lewis Gray was from the Oakland Nature Preserve survey. So you always check your birds of prey as they're up in the air and, and the short tail hawks, they like to hide in the vultures. Next. All right, and then we have like Bob White, which I don't think I got last year, but you'll hear a lot of them. This one you just have to get lucky. You know, you just never know. Next. And then um, common nighthawk, you just have to go out at the right time, dusk and dawn. They do like generally open fields, pastures, things like that. And then Sam got really lucky with this Chuck Wills widow because we hear them, but to see one is really tough. Next. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Sam. Oh, all right. So that's a terrible picture of me that looks like I ate everybody else that was on the June challenge. Um, so my apologies for that. Um, I'm Sam. Uh, last year was my first year doing the June challenge. And I think about three days into it, I said that I hated it because <laughs> we were all so competitive, but we were all helping each other out. Um, I think I probably put, you know, thousands of miles on my car and I actually live in Seminole County, which is even worse that I do Orange County. Um, but it's a cool thing to do. It's super fun. And, you know, got to give props to uh, Rex for starting this thing because, you know, it's, it's interesting that it's June challenge because it is such a hot time here. It's obviously less birds than we normally have. Like, you know, like Kathy said, you know, I think with the indigo buntings and the blue gross beaks, I think like July 1st, we saw, <laughs> we saw them, but we were looking all month and, you know, going and finding it, it, what I found from the whole thing is it makes you really realize, you know, where certain spots are and finding these birds and kind of sharing the info. But then the rest of the year, you're going back to these same spots. I, I found an email from Mary, her and I pretty much birded the whole time together during uh, Mary soul during the pandemic and all that. And <clears throat> it was, the, the email when she sent me her final list, I looked it up today and it said, man, that was so much fun. And I found a bunch more new favorite hotspots. So I think that's probably the key to it. And, you know, me being newer to the birding community around here and birding in general, you know, Kathy has been in this area for a long time, Deb, and just people sharing like, well, you know, you can go here to get a Kestrel and, you know, you can always go here to get this. And, you know, that's, that's a cool thing. And, and it's a, it's a really big part, I think of the whole thing, aside from it being a competition, it's, uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, I was completely out of work. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was hitting it hard every day and as much as I could stand the heat, but, um, you know, it's, 
as Kathy was saying, there's certain spots and not to give away all the secrets, but um, I think I was the only one in Orange County that got the prothonotary last year and that Acadian flycatcher, but that was because other birders were like, hey, you know, you can go get these here. And, but with the Wakiva River, especially where Deb and I live, you have to be on, like the bird has to be on a certain side of the river for it to be Orange County or Seminole County. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. And I had to have coerce a buddy of mine, Mark Mark, that you guys know from Facebook. He, uh, he brought his kayaks over. We went down to the little park in my neighborhood and he ran over to use uh, the portalette as we were putting the kayaks in the water and a prothonotary flew over and landed on the dock. And I was so excited. And then I realized we were still in Seminole County. So it didn't count for Orange County. But luckily we went, you know, about a hundred yards down the creek and got on the river. And we actually saw both birds within about 10 minutes. So I got really lucky with those. Um, if you want to go to the next, we should have done the next slide anyway, because I look so terrible. Um, so these are two birds that were, I think I'm the only one that got those two because it was just luck of the draw on this. Uh, I went to the Orlando wetlands looking for black skimmers and found them. And when I turned around to walk back towards the parking lot, I see this bird and I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, that's, you know, that's a turn. And so I took a couple quick snaps and I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's a gold bill turn. And I was heading over to Tosa Hatchie because it's right near there, as I was talking to someone earlier about, but on the way there, I took a picture of the back of my camera. I sent it to Paul Huber and I was like, man, am I crazy? This is a gold bill turn. And he goes, yeah, that's a good find, you know, not super rare, but rare. And I was, so I was so excited. And I think, you know, Kathy was coming in when I was leaving and I'm like, you know, I just saw this, but I can't find it. Um, I can't remember what other bird we were looking for there, Kathy. There was something else. It might've been chat maybe, cause we're always looking for that, but um, but anyway, so that was a cool bird. And then right about the week before the June challenge ended, I pulled into the wildlife drive looking for, you know, anything I could find that I didn't have already. And literally I, before the first bathrooms, I see this bird going across the road with the, with the red winged blackbird chasing it. And immediately I'm like, oh, it must just be a red shoulder hawk. And I just went click, click and took two shots. And then I immediately looked at it. And this lady in front of me goes, did you see that owl? And I was like, yes, it's a barn owl. And it's one of the first ones I had seen on the drive, especially this time of year. So that was really cool. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a cool thing to do. I still don't understand all the rules. And like I was looking at my list from last year and I sent, when I sent in my list and I said, look, it's my first year. I don't know, like, I have the, the swans at Lake Eola are my nemesis, uh, the peacocks. I don't know. I just think they're kind of trash birds <laughs> because everybody argues whether they're countable and they're not ABA countable. And I don't know. I'm kind of a stickler for the rules. I go and count them. And like I said, I just sent them in just to see. But obviously, you know, you've got all those at Lake Eola. Um, one little tidbit of information I'll share with you. Uh for birds that you don't see on the drive or, you know, in your yard, anytime you're at Lowe's or Home Depot, I think go to the garden section and you can get house sparrows, house finch, usually Eurasian collared dove, starling. I mean, you can pick up half a dozen birds in those box stores that most people don't even think about. So that, and that's one of those things that's like, oh, you know, I can get four or five birds going to pick up, you know, a new set of gloves. So that kind of thing, I think, is kind of cool and interesting. And one thing we're finding, and I, I learned last year, even on, you know, what is it, the 414, like the toll road, which does cost you money. But a lot of those uh, reservoirs and, um, you know, just the ditches on the side of the road, a lot of the shorebirds, I think that's where I got my white rump sandpiper last year because I couldn't find them, you know, the day after we saw them all at the drive. Um, and I've been watching the weather like crazy. My wife's birthday is Saturday. So we're watching it for that. But then I'm also like, well, Tuesday is the first and it's supposed to rain. So it could be good for shorebirds on the sod fields. So again, it's uh, it'll take over your life. And uh, I blame Rex for that. Um, 
do you do you still do it rex do you do it every year oh yeah i've this is i've done it every year uh, yep. so yep. far at least now do you do you best your number each year oh no oh. it's all it's all very dependent on the the conditions in the county right uh low water conditions mean more birds and uh when conditions are what we think of as normal then we generally get fewer right but now are you as adamant about it as you were when you started uh as far as hitting it hard every day i am i am not quite as competitive as i used to be i've gotten i've gotten older and wiser <laughs> Well, I will say tired her. So. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, every, even last year, I was like, I'm not going to do it. And you talk to some of the older and better birders, and they're like, no, I'm not going to do it. And then this year, actually, Lori Leach is on here, and she was she was texting me on the side. She's like, are you going to do this? Which county are you doing? I'm like, I don't want to do it, but I'm going to probably do it. <laughs> because you can't stay away. It is, I mean, aside from the competition with other people, like for yourself and that feeling of like, okay, I got to go out and find this bird and to find it is pretty cool. And I, I don't know, it, uh, Lori just asked on text, is are the rules somewhere that people can find them? Like, I didn't know about the the audible that you had to see the bird. So I, as Kathy said that, I immediately went back to my list from last year and I'm like, I knew I had, of all the species I saw, I have pictures of all but four. And then I, I wanted to double check that I didn't have a Chucks on here because <laughs> right. I was like, I probably didn't see a Chucks, but I know I've got a picture of a Bob White. So that was the only other one I was worried about. I think uh, uh, the uh, rules just got sent out to the Bird Brains list, sir. Okay. So yeah. we're going to put it on our website. Oh, perfect. Oh, okay. All right. That's yeah. good. We'll put it there and we're, we do some social media posts through Facebook. Um, that'll have a link for that, but yeah. And someone asked about being out. Yeah, if you're out of town, you can just do as much as you want because it can be a competition for yourself because like Sam and I were talking, you know, I want to just beat what I did last year. So that, Also, that's if, you're, if you're out of town for part of the month, then do a June challenge for the two weeks that you're in Orange County. And then when you go to upstate New York, as I did uh, a few years back, I did a June challenge in Jefferson County, New York as well. Oh, cool. And that was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Saw si singing golden winged warblers. That was terrific. Wow. Nice. Oh, that's awesome. Really cool. Yeah. And yeah, honestly, one tip is, too. yeah. The tip is that the first few days hit it really hard and the last few days hit it really hard because the first you might get some, hold on, that's my bird clock, <laughs> my Audubon clock. So the first few days you might get some leftover birds that haven't left yet from spring. And then closer to July, you might get some early migrants. So that's something to keep in mind too. Yeah, shorebirds, Louisiana water thrush, black and white warbler. They're all yeah. quite possible in, in uh, late June. So excited now. Yes, <laughs> ready. <laughs> we're ready. And if you do it, um, <clears throat> Orange Audubon's keeping track for uh, Orange County. You can send it to me um, and I send it. To, actually, if you're doing any county, and you're listening to this podcast, you can send it to me and just tell me your county. And actually, I'll give you the rules. And then I'll send it to the compiler who's in, in Alachua County. He's very kindly compiling this year. Yeah, she was great last year. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks, Rex, for joining us. Sure, glad to yes, do thank it. Thank you, sir. Yes, really sir. fun. Good talking to you. Good talking to you too, Sam. Congratulations on last year's performance. Thank you. Oh, I do have to mention, apparently earlier we were talking and this year's winner gets a trophy. And I can tell you that last year's winner did not get a trophy. Um, I guess I you'll have to win this year too. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. So figured I'd throw that out there. So 
and we're we're planning a little small small covid covid safe little gathering for those that want to attend that did the challenge and just you know we'll we'll have more information to be announced but that's something you know like a birds and beverages where you can share your best june challenge story with everybody and see the winner yeah we we always end the season with a with a party as well we are so we didn't spread rock. out that it, it's that? not it's not like Gainesville here. We're very spread out. So we, yeah. we just haven't gravitated to birds and brews and stuff, but I think we'll try it for this special occasion. Hear the war stories. Yes. That's good. That's fun. For sure. It's like the CBCs, you know, so it's kind of the same idea. So very, cool. very true. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming. All right. Thank thanks you. for having me. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Rex. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you. Thank you to the photographers who, who uh, sent pictures. Yeah. Awesome. And now that Rex is gone since he started it, and he's much more admirable than I am, I'm going to hide my lists the entire <laughs> month of June. I'm not sharing any information with anyone. Uh -oh. I was lying about Lowe's. There's nothing there. <laughs>